Welcome to InvestorCom's Wealth Compliance Leader Series. In today's conversation, we have an absolute pleasure of speaking with Mr. Jason Berkowitz, Chief Legal and Regulatory Affairs Officer at the Insured Retirement Institute. Jason is, a, is an accomplished expert on the many regulations that impact the retirement industry. And I can say from firsthand experience that his inclusive and collaborative approach to stakeholder engagement and advocacy is truly unique and engaging in many respects. Jason, welcome. Very excited to speak with you this morning. Thank you, Parham. It's great to be here with you. Great. Jason, if, if someone were to pick up uh, your single page bio, they'd see that you're a prominent leader in our industry. Um, if we were to kind of step back from that, super curious, what even got you interested in this area to begin with? You know, it was an interesting path for me to get here. And, and I think for many people in the insurance space, they would say the same. Uh, not many people grow up saying, I want to work in the insurance industry. Uh, you know, it's uh, not quite as glamorous as being an astronaut or a major league baseball player, uh, but, uh, but it is rewarding. And, and I'm glad that I found my way here. Um, you know, I found my way into this line of work uh, through uh, a series of uh, job changes over the course of my career. I started out in Manhattan. Uh, working out as a securities lawyer at a big white shoe firm, uh, made my way up to uh, Hartford, Connecticut, which uh, at the time still had a fairly decent claim on the title of insurance capital of the world, uh, and found myself working for a law firm doing work in the insurance space. Uh, did a brief stint at the uh, United Technologies Corporation, uh, which has uh, many, many uh, entities throughout the, uh, throughout the Connecticut area. Uh, and eventually got a call from a, uh, a recruiter looking for somebody with securities law background to come into the uh, life insurance industry, uh, but doing government affairs work. And, and that was something that I had never done before, but they were working at the time on the, uh, what was the original version of the uh, suitability rule, uh, then under the auspices of the NAS NASD uh, prior to their name change and, and merger, uh, which resulted in FINRA. And I had an opportunity to really kind of learn a little bit about how the, organiz the organization operated, how the industry operated, uh, and how the industry was regulated. And I found it fascinating. Uh, I really enjoyed the opportunity to be part of the process of, of developing the rules that people have to follow when they're providing these important products and services, learning more and more about the products that are offered and how they can help people uh, really caught my attention. And uh, I'll be honest, it was, it was really nice to not have to do work, work in billable hours anymore. Oh yeah, those uh, billable hours uh, are an experience to say the least. So suitable, working on suitability type of policies, um, working on both sides of the fence, you know, uh, seeing where you sit now, Jason, if you, if you had this formidable magic wand, uh, super curious what, what you do with that, um, if you could, you know, it's a really interesting question. I, I think, you know, I think that this industry has so much potential and we already do so much great work for the people that we serve, but there are still too many people out there that are looking to game the system, that are looking for ways to leverage these products to line their own product, product pockets. Uh, and, 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 you know, I'd love to see the industry and the regulatory community really truly come together in a collaborative way to get all those bad actors out, make sure that people can always rely on the, the person that's sitting across the table, providing them with advice about how to achieve their financial goals, whether it's retirement planning or otherwise, and, and not have to worry that, the, that that person is, is looking to take advantage of them or, or manipulate them or, or abuse them in some way. Um, you know, that's a pipe dream. Uh, and, and it's sad that it is, but it is the case. And uh, it's an honor to be part of the effort to try to uh, work with both both sides, with the industry and with the regulators, uh, to find ways to reduce that. And hopefully, to someday find that to be uh, much, much more clearly the exception, uh, and and no no longer a key focus that regulators have to constantly be uh, worrying about. Yeah, great, great answer, and. and uh... As long as we were lucky enough to have people like you in the industry, Jason, I think uh, I think that's a that's a strong um, and positive light to kind of go on here. Um, you, you've touched on sort of regulations and, and some of the most uh, pressing pieces of regs 
in our space, in the wealth management space, has been Reg BI and the most recent uh, Department of Labor's PTE 2020-02. Um, they're truly intended to sort of, I guess, uh, enhance the advisor-client relationship. And I, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are, are on these and their impact on, on the, exactly the intention, that advisor-client relationship. Yeah, I mean, I think that they they have both uh, found a, a good balance uh, to ensure that there are appropriate rules in place that can still allow the business to operate the way that it needs to and, and have the ability to provide a wide variety of, of types of products and services. Uh, some of the other uh, approaches that we've seen historically from, from different regulators uh, has have, as you know, uh, had the uh, unintended consequence of causing people to lose access to some of those products and services. Uh, and that's an unintended consequence. And I say that it's a very important to keep that in mind. The, the folks that are doing the work on this on the regulatory side, these are people who have dedicated their careers and their lives to public service. And, and they're to be respected and, and appreciated for that. And you know, while we don't always see eye to eye on how they go about it, uh, generally speaking, I find that you, you really can't question their, their objectives, uh, which are to similar to my, uh, my magic wand answer, uh, you know, to try to get to that point where people are actually doing the right thing. People are, are, are dealing with their clients the way that they would want other people to deal with their, with their loved ones. And um, you know, I think that Reg BI, I, I think that PTE 202, and I would add in the NAIC's uh, uh, best interest uh, regulation, uh, you know, those really do strike that right balance between uh, making clear that you must, as a financial professional, act in your client's best interest, uh, and and you have to provide clear disclosure. You have to deal with your conflicts of interest. You have to make sure that you are not doing things that are going to benefit you at the uh, to the detriment of your client. Uh, and they provide some some real significant teeth uh, for the regulators to punish those that violate those those expectations. And, and so I think that they're uh, you know they're well done. And we need to see some. We need some time to see how they operate in the real world. Uh, even the most ideal academic solution uh, can find that it uh, has flaws when it's exposed to reality. And I think it'll be very interesting in the coming years to see how these things uh, actually play out. And you know, for our part here, for my part, uh, if there are gaps that need to be addressed, let's talk about them. Let's get them on the table. Let's figure out why there's a gap. What is allowing somebody to slip through those cracks? And how do we stop it from going forward? Yeah, really well said, Jason. Thanks for sharing that. I'm, uh, you know, you said slipping through the cracks. And what the one element of regulation that hasn't actually slipped through the cracks, it ha it's had between state-based regulation regulators, FINRA, the SEC, and now the Department of Labor is, is rollovers. Um, you know, if you could, <laughs> can you help our audience understand the rationale behind the regulatory focus around rollovers? Honestly, it's, it's not that complicated, Parham. It, follow the money. Uh, that's where the most, the majority of the money is. The retirement system is, is one of the largest segments of the overall wealth of this country. And uh, within the retirement system, a significant uh, majority of it is part of the, the rollover uh, uh, industry. Uh, you know, these are folks that are people who have, have built up, you know, small or, or moderate savings at various jobs throughout their careers. And they find themselves working with an advisor who says, hey, let's, let's bring that all under one roof. Let's, you know, let me help you with that. Let's make sure that we're investing that money in a way that's going to make you make sure that it uh, is most likely to, to grow the way that you want it and, and achieve those uh, outcomes that you're looking for. And, um, you know, when, when, the, when there's a lot of money at play, uh, that attracts all kinds, uh, and it certainly attacks, uh, attracts the, the attention of, of policymakers and, and regulators as it should. Excellent. That's an excellent summary. That follow the money, is, as uh, as they say. So, so specifically, the most recent um, sort of uh, magnifying lens is, is the prohibited transaction exemption 202. Um, it places additional emphasis on what individual reps need to do and financial advisors need to do when they recommend rollover transactions. Um, a, you know, first of all, what are your thoughts on these new set of requirements for the industry? Yeah, I think that they're, I think they're appropriate and, and I think they're workable. Um, it, it's, it's hard to argue with the idea that when a financial advisor recommends that a client consider a rollover, that they should have to explain why. 
that they should have to explain how they're going to get paid. Uh, you know, the way that advisors get paid is, is not always clear to, to the average consumer, and, and it's appropriate for them to have a, a right to understand that. It's also important to make sure that, uh, that advisors and clients understand that conflicts of interest are a natural part of, of this industry. You have a professional who is charged with helping another person uh, manage their money, and they're going to be paid for that. And the things that they get paid for have different levels of compensation attached to them, and, and often for very good reason. And, uh, but that does also create that possibility that conflicts could taint that, that advice. And, and so I think what, what, uh, what, the, uh, what the Department of Labor's PTE does is really ensure that when uh, clients are getting that recommendation to roll over, that they're doing it with uh, their eyes wide open. Uh, you know, to borrow a phrase that the SEC likes to use, they're making an informed investment decision. Yeah. Hey, well said, um, Jason. If 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 now, if sort of, you look at it from the individual financial professionals lens as they're looking to adopt the PTE requirements, the the Reg BI requirements, the, the NAIC requirements. What, what do you what do you believe uh, the role of technology is in that in that sort of intersection? Oh, technology is critical to this. It's it's not going to really be possible to uh, to do the job as well as you could without the without the benefit of technology. You're going to use technology to identify uh, differences between the product that the client is is currently in and the product that you're recommending. Uh, you're going to help you. You're going to use technology to to document everything as a, as a financial advisor, so that everything that needs to be captured is captured appropriately and accurately. Uh, and that's gonna benefit everybody involved because there will be a clear record that explains what was done, what was considered, what information was gathered and how a decision was made about what to recommend, what sort of conversations were had uh, in advance of a decision being made or a transaction being executed. And, and technology is gonna make that so much easier. Uh, you know, you think back to the old days of scribbling and on those long yellow legal pads and you put those dot, those pages in your files and you know th that that stuff fades over time handwriting is not always clear and legible and reliable uh using technology is just a much more effective and, and clear way to do that and uh you know i'm i am not a technology expert but i think i probably in, in this answer probably just scratched the surface on, on the, the great things that technology can do to assist both the advisor and the client in, in, uh, in making sure that this is all done the right way Absolutely. Well said, Jason. I, I can't imagine the additional, um, you know, frankly, the additional amount of time that would be required to, to handle all those elements on a manual basis, you know, pulling in the, the plan costs, documenting, as you mentioned, and then delivering something directly to, to the client to say, hey, here's a rationale, for example, for a, for a rollover, or here's a rationale for why I recommended a, a product to you. So, um, yeah. Technology can certainly play a synergistic uh, uh, um, role in that in that client uh, uh, and financial advisor or financial professional construct. Yeah, um, I would also I would also add I think it actually can also be extremely beneficial in advance of the recommendation being made uh, when the advisor is just learning how to go about doing doing their job. Uh, the, the ability to be to receive extensive training on a wide range of topics through uh, remote technology like Zoom, like LinkedIn Learning, like, you know, the variety of things that are out there. Uh, these are things that can enable a, an advisor to make sure that they know everything that they need to know uh, before they even sit down with the client. What questions do I need to ask? How do I make a decision about what to recommend? What does it mean to be in a client's best interest? All of these things are, you know, there's a common sense answer to a lot of them, but then there's a technical legal sense answer to those. And, and that's important for them to have and technology can uh, can really facilitate the delivery of that information. Absolutely, well said. Hey, I know, I know you sit at a very, very inter inter intersect, interesting intersection of our industry where you engage regulators. We've talked previously about sort of what's coming down the pipe. Um, what do you believe firms who are getting ready for this wave of examinations around Reg BI, NIIC, you mentioned PT 2020-02, how should they go about prioritizing uh, um, those sets of compliance requirements on a global forward basis? Yeah, it's there's they're going to have a lot to deal with. It's going to it's going to be hard, especially early on, as they as they learn, you know, what are the regulators looking for? What are they expecting to see? 
Uh, I think that to the credit of the regulators, in many cases, uh, their initial examinations are being done more on a uh, compliance assistance basis. I know the SEC was very, uh, very public in, in explaining that the early examinations on regulation best interest were focused more on here's where you're coming short, here's what you need to do to fix that. And you know, next time we come in, we're going to expect to see things improve. Uh, and now they've moved past that into a more uh, a robust set of expectations. Uh, I hope we'll see the same from the Department of Labor as they begin their examination process. Uh, I suspect that we will to some degree. Um, but I think you know, from the perspective of the firms and the advisors and, and those that are going to be examined, uh, you know, I think it's, it's just a matter of you know, making sure that as you're going through the work, that you're doing it to the best of your ability in compliance with the expectations. You know, listen when the regulators speak. If you have, for example, a, a speech was given by a, an SEC commissioner uh, at an event a couple of months ago that received some significant pr uh, press attention, listen to that, read that, read those re remarks. They're posted on the SEC website. There's a lot of good information in there to help you understand what they're looking for. Um, you know, look on the SEC website, the FINRA website, the DOL website, you can really get a sense of what's important to them to make sure that if you have to make choices about where you're going to focus your efforts on compliance uh, early on, that you're focusing on the same things that they are. Um, and, and I would also say, you know, the right, and you hear this from regulators all the time, call them, reach out to them, ask them questions. They, they're not in the business of trying to, tr to trick people into violating their rules. I, I think if you ask any regulator to a person, if they would prefer to have no call for enforcement action because everybody is compliant, or if they'd like to have you know, a boatload of, uh, of compliance in enforcement cases that they have to pursue, they would choose the former in a heartbeat. Uh, and so if you're not sure how to comply with something, reach out, ask them a question and see what, you know, see what information you get or work through trade groups like, like mine, uh, the Insured Retirement Institute. If you're a member of a group like ours or others, uh, leverage those relationships. Who, they often have direct lines into these, uh, these regulatory bodies uh, and can get you answers to questions. Um, and you can also leverage you know, industry groups to, to find out what your peers are doing. Uh, I know at IRI, we often put together uh, opportunities for our members to sit down together and compare notes on uh, subject to antitrust rules, of course, uh, being cognizant of that, but talking you know, at a high level about you know, how are we working to comply with these rules? And where might we need additional guidance from the regulator? So there's a lot of ways that you can go about getting that information to make sure that you're on the right track. Jason, you, as always, as I always say, say to you, you are a incredible resource to our industry, incredibly insightful. And as, as you said earlier, uh, your vision of collaboration across the different sort of sides of the industry is truly, uh, truly, truly unique. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for being part of our show. and and. Uh, uh, we're welcome to come back anytime. Well, thank you so much, Parham. It was a pleasure to be here, as always. Uh, enjoy spending time with you and talking about these subjects. And uh, I'd love to visit with you again soon. Excellent. Take care.